Welcome to Redeeming Missions, an every home podcast where we explore the heart of what it means to carry Christ to our world. I'm Tanner Peak, and I'm so glad that you're joining me today. Welcome to another episode of the Redeeming Missions podcast. I'm super pumped to be sitting here with David Perkins. He's the pastor of Radiant Church in Kansas City, Missouri. No, no, it's in Kansas, Kansas. Kansas. Overland Park. That's so confusing about <laughs> Kansas City. It's in two states. Uh, you'll forgive me for my, That's right. my lack of geographical knowledge. Oh, you're good. I'm excited about having David here. He's a pastor. Um, I would say, I was just saying this to him earlier. I think he's a sp- he's become a spiritual father, a voice, I think, for a generation that mm. I think is going to be continue to be significant for years to come. And so I'm grateful that we have you. Thanks for, he made a journey here an honor. just for this. So I feel like he, he I, I actually need to say this as well. He's a board member uh, of, of Every Home for Christ, which just means in a way he's my boss. <laughs> So, <laughs> Not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an honor, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me. What a joy. I love you, love Beth, love this team, love the staff, love the board, love the mission, love the vision. I've been able to be connected for a long time, actually. And so yeah. uh, it's just a privilege to get to talk to you today. How? What was your first exposure to Every Home for Christ? Yeah, summer of 1997, uh, Dick Eastman led a prayer session where we uh, prayed over the nations of the world. And so uh, I was a, a 20 year old um, with on the ground with my nose in a map yes. uh, praying for the nations. And so I don't know how much exposure I'd had to anything like that before, but uh, I loved it. I loved the sense of um, big faith that my small prayers in Colorado Springs were making a, a difference in the globe. Mm-hmm. And I was, I don't know if I was 19, 20, but that was powerful. And then um, I've stayed connected in some way or another ever since. That's what what year was that? 97. 97. That's yeah. incredible. So he's for anybody listening to this Perkins is more or less a local. I mean, he's an insider outsider. He's one of us uh, in so many ways here at every home. Well, David, the what the way that we start every one of these podcasts yeah. is asking people to just share a little bit of their story. And I love this. I, I genuinely love this part of the podcast as much as anything. Some people choose to tell their story, you know, their salvation story. Some of people just tell us like, what were they like in high school? <laughs> um, and I like that. I like all of the above because yeah. I like to know. Go I like, I think, yeah, I like to ha- know how people were formed and shaped and the way that God, uh, yeah, really, yeah. really touched their lives. So I'm going to just, ha- I'm just, I'm just setting you up. I'm giving you a. Uh, a slow ball over the plate, and you just tell me whatever whatever comes to your heart. Yeah, I'd be happy to tell my story. I just want to start by saying, Tanner, I'm so impressed by the way that you uh, have stepped into leadership at, at every home. Uh, I've watched your humility from when you came here um, and just said, I believe the mission and vision of this house at a sacrificial level and to watch the wind of God just breathe on you and watch you just take on more responsibility, more responsibility, more responsibility into now really the weight of leading uh, what is really one of the most beautiful uh, missions organizations Mm. on the planet today. And so well done. You're amazing. And it is an honor and a joy. Um, And... To get to talk to you. Uh, My journey, um, yeah, so uh, I like to say this, I'm a triplet. uh, And so I I was born to incredible parents, a younger brother. And um, I I think the angle that I'd like to share my story is the angle of prayer. Um, Because I think that that's one of the things that I have a burden for right now. I think that uh, we're living in a time where we need more prayer. I'm going to use a a military term, which can be offensive to some people. Prayer generals, prayer, prayer mothers and fathers. Use, prayer leaders might be the best word. I just think that we're in a time um, where I'm believing God in faith for praying churches, for uh, churches that care about the nations. And so I want to just kind of overlap my story with with prayer. My uh, my journey was uh, uh, actually as a as a kid, my dad walked with me very close in discipleship. My dad was a, a massive family discipleship. Before there was John Tyson, there was Hal Perkins. Before mm-hmm. there was the intentional father, there was, wow. uh, which I love John Tyson. Uh, he, but my dad was doing similar things with me. Mm-hmm. And when I was in the ninth grade, um, 
I started a prayer meeting that met every day in my, my public junior high, and I watched God work powerfully. Mm. Um, and I, in a public junior high, I saw um, salvation. I saw a, a swell of teenagers come to n- not just know Jesus, but um, care about the things of God, scripture, worship, and it marked me mm. as a teenager. Um, and so uh, that continued through high school. And then in my college years, um, I ran in prayer youth ministries, mobilization of young people to pray. And, uh, and then when I uh, got married, I married Renata, and we um, actually came, moved to Colorado Springs. We were believing God for young people to continue to pray. And we uh, got an apartment here on the North End, and um, we would just get uh, on our face, just the two of us, um, mm-hmm. before there was... Before we were leading big prayer meetings in the World Prayer Center, before there was, you know, thousands of young people coming for desperation or some of those things, um, it was just Renata and I, sorry, just praying, believing God, mm. and um, and th- those were powerful days. Um, and so I think then I spent uh, I spent fourteen years. Uh, it's a it's a privilege. Two thousand two thousand fourteen. Um, uh, leading a, a prayer a youth prayer movement at New Life called Desperation. And then, um, and then I spent a couple of years here uh, as in a prayer role. And then I um, planted a church in Kansas City in 2016, and um, it's going so well. It is a delight. So we started in 2016, and um, we're seeing people come to know Jesus. We have a strong emphasis on discipleship. Actually, my dad is our discipleship pastor, and so uh, that's a fun. Fun turnaround. My my son is our youth director of prayer and preaching, hmm. and uh, we've started a new youth conference called Bold. Yeah, um, and Dawson's really my son. He's nineteen, and he's pioneering that. And so I have four children: uh, Dawson, Olivia, Adeline, and Justice, and they are all teenagers, and they're all a part of that. And so uh, we're seeing God work powerfully. It's just it's a it's a beautiful season. Our church is uh, seven and a half years old, and it's going great. I love your story. I love that you overlapped it with prayer. Yeah. Um, I just think that that's such a core message. It's who God made you to be. It's who, what you bring, I think, to the body or part of what you bring to the body. Let's just talk about prayer for a second. Let's just talk about what what is it about prayer that really captured your heart? I mean, from way back. I mean, you're talking about a lifelong journey. <laughs> and I, what is it that captured your heart about prayer? Yeah, I think... Um, So my dad was a systematic disciple maker that trained us how to spend time alone with Jesus when we were children. So while other Hmm. fathers were teaching T-ball, my dad was teaching us how to journal and pray. So many of the prayer resources, even that we build out here at Every Home for Christ, trying to help people in their daily prayer effort, my dad was doing that with his children. So when Hmm. I faced a crisis in junior high, um, it was my relationship with God that was my strength. And then... um, and then, and then I think that was big, you know, the, that, uh, I, 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 just the, the, the pain of, um, rejection and being bullied, but I found a relationship with God in junior high. And then really in high school, uh, it moved into mobilizing my friends to pray. So I saw some, some of my friends give their lives to Christ and then we started prayer meeting. So <laughs> I have people ask me that, uh, you know, when, when did you get this passion for prayer? And my answer is as a teenager, you know, that was really when it happened. And I think it was not just the, um, the friendship with God helping me sustain, they though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, when you feel like you're going through a trial. And just like people are listening to this podcast right now that are going through a trial, honestly, in my own journey right in life right now, there's a big trial going on. But it's in those trials that prayer is the uh, foundation that you find strength and life in God. So many people look at it as a discipline um, that checkbox got to do it to prove to God that I like him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think when you have a... Uh, one of the things I love that we do at every home is we try to give people the invitation to draw close and to build that relationship as the, um, you know, the atomic habits world would say as a keystone habit. Yeah, that's right. right. And um, and so build that 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 was formed in me as I'll, I'll I'll go ahead and use that keystone habit as a junior high student, mm-hmm. and so um, then that led <laughs> to really just I, I I think that I, I started to believe 
that God worked supernaturally when people prayed as a teenager because I saw salvations, mm -hmm. because I saw God at work, um, because I saw a handful of teenagers start to pray. And then I saw this prayer meeting swell to really, really large. And um, so I just started to believe. And then and then my, as I became an adult and went into college ministry, same thing. You know, I connected to prayer environments where we were praying consistently. And just I just saw God at work and um, started to believe that prayer was where the action is. You know, the old John Wesley quote, um, that prayer really was it, where the action was. It, was. it was God at work in the world. And so I love to say that prayer becomes the front row seat. Hmm. And that front row seat is better than than a 50 yard line seat or courtside, you know, it's, right. it's seeing God at work. And um, that's where some of those bedrock things happened for me as a teenager, expanded in my college years. And then when I began as a youth pastor and uh, was given the opportunity to start a, a youth prayer uh, conference, tours, uh, prayer meetings, I just loved it. And I just saw God mm -hmm. work and I saw kids set free. I saw kids come to know Jesus. And so, yeah, I'm a practitioner. As a practitioner, I believe um, that's kind of how it started. I like that. I think most people who believe in prayer, yeah, I mean, you can usually go back and trace parts of their story of moments of desperation to borrow from, yeah, it's I think great some word. David Perkins <laughs> language, but moments of desperation where they're crying out yeah. uh, to God, they <clears throat> need something that's beyond them. I wonder, I'm, I'm trying to think of the question I'm trying to ask here. So yeah. it's just going to kind of come out, um, maybe a little bit messy. But I think a lot of our audience is millennial. Yeah. There's people that are watching this. And then another category of our audience is international. I mean, so we have a whole international yeah. group of individuals that are engaging with this. And I think there's a lot of diversity in where people are coming from as sure. they listen to this. Yeah. I'm thinking about a specific type of person who maybe is listening to this and they're hearing what you're saying, they're talking about prayer, but maybe maybe they're a little jaded. Maybe that they, you know, maybe they were intercessors at one point or they, they prayed a lot. Maybe in their early years of the faith, they were really excited, zealous about prayer, but maybe they're just, you know, in the process of becoming a mom or a dad or working hard in a kind of a, a professional environment, whatever the environment is, but now, they're feeling just a little bit like, yeah, 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 prayer. I I'm wondering if you have ever had seasons yourself yeah. where you became weary or discouraged with yeah. prayer. Has that ever been part of your journey? Yeah, I think that becoming weary is normal and common and has been a part of my journey. I, I look at my own life and there's been lots of uh, challenging circumstances where it's tempting to give up on prayer, to punt on prayer, to become a tired intercessor because circumstance didn't turn out like I had hoped. But I think that um, when we read Jesus, Jesus believed, Jesus right. preached, Jesus told us. So I do think that our foundation, even apart from our circumstance, yeah. even apart from the leaders that let us down, even apart yeah. from where we had big faith and didn't see it turn out like we had hoped, I think that bedrock is that we have a biblical conviction that when Jesus told us to ask, we'll receive, seek, and we'll find, knock, and the door will be open for everyone. You know, And I know that you're a preacher, I'm a preacher, and we say that. I, I think that that's uh, critical. I think for the millennial that feels discouraged, I get it. Uh, I, I think that um, it's easy to swing the pendulum. I'm disillusioned. I'm hurt uh, because of leaders, circumstance, finances, someone died, sickness, whatever. And it's easily easy to swing the pendulum back um, uh, because of disappointment or because you've been let down. And I would just invite people to go back to life is but a mere breath. I only have these decades on the planet. Standing in faith is all that I have. So I have leaders that have let me down. I have people that I've prayed for that did not get well. I have revivals that I've asked for that I haven't seen happen yet. I have a friend that I've been praying for to come to know Jesus hmm. for 30 years. <laughs> and I met with him <clears throat> on Thursday. And he doesn't live in Kansas City. He flew in. But... I'm still believing and I'm still asking and we're in year 29, right? But, but who knows, you know, like, and so I think that um, when Jesus talks about prayer, he, he speaks of it like children hmm. and we become cynical because we lose that. We yeah. don't, we don't want to have a tender heart. Yeah. 
<clears throat> we don't want us to keep the gift of faith. We want to say, I know that the way the world is, I have access to the internet, I've been hurt. I know that theologically, I can create some theological knots as to why I don't want to believe that when I pray, God does stuff. But I wanna encourage the cynical, and le- I'm not saying cynical in a mean way. I mean, like, I could be that. Yeah, I feel like being right. that. To just come back, Sermon on the Mount, the way that Jesus tells us to pray is like a child. And um, and that's, that is challenging, um, but that I believe is a part of our biblical conviction. And I believe that when we make time to, pr- to, to uh, be with him mm. and, uh, and then to gather with our families, I, I, I'm, I'm believing God uh, for praying uh, pastors mm-hmm. uh, that we need in our, in our generation, praying marriages, literally just little habits. Not, it doesn't have to be these grandiose stories. Yeah. Just a praying marriage where you reach over, uh, you take your spouse's hand and you pray for 30 seconds. Hmm. Um, uh, praying fathers, you know, that for me, the, that's, that's the fun one is, uh, especially when I think about millennials who are that age group raising children, you know, like praying parents that are intentional um, to pray with their families. And so, and then, and then I'm believing God for praying churches as well, you know, that are intentional with it. So I think that we've, um, we've had some great, some great prayer heroes in the last generation. And we've had some, some prayer leaders that uh, have hurt us. Um, And this is, it's our turn. We've got one shot. And so um, apart from the pain and apart from the disappointment to believe in what the word of God says, stand with a childlike heart. Yeah. And keep contending in prayer no matter the circumstance. I think some of the most innocent prayers that I've ever prayed yeah. have actually been at my moments yeah. of, of greatest disillusionment and oftentimes disillusionment with God. Yep. I mean, I have this, as you were talking, I have this memory in my mind when I was probably young 20s. I, I can't get into the whole circumstance, but God really let me down. I felt like God really disappointed me. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember I was living in San Francisco at the time and I, I went out on a walk. It was raining out and I went out and I walked, I mean, it was like miles in this park and just screamed at God. Yes. I just, God, where are you? Yes. What are you thinking? You know, and that kind of honesty in prayer. Yep. Um, I think that the Lord, I've always felt like the Lord, the Lord can handle that. I mean, this mm. is a relationship, but he can handle that kind of prayer to him. But I think sometimes disillusionment or even jadedness is actually a, a perfect moment to open up your mouth and be honest with God and allow God to meet you. And my story, I did that for, I mean, who knows, half an hour, 45 minutes. And I got down to the ocean, it was raining. Yeah. And I stood on the beach and I just wept. Yeah. It was like I needed to just, just offload all of my disillusionment and I just wept before the Lord and I walked away from there as close to the Lord as I can remember, <laughs> like back, I'm back in the game, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think sometimes, I think our generation just needs to be told, go, go be honest with God. Yeah. Go talk to God about your disillusionment. Go talk to God about how that leader disappointed you. Yes. I think prayer is really at the heart of spiritual health for our generation. I think it's why it's important that we have David Perkins and the body of Christ telling us, get back to talking to God. Um, I don't know, do you ever have any stories like that or have any thoughts on what I just said? I love mentors and models, right? But if mentors and models become the uh, reason you're not praying, then they've failed. Right. The prayer is simplistic talking to God. And so what you said about when you're just honest in San Francisco, you know, down by the water, and you're just raw, uh, cast your burdens on him because he cares. That's right. And so when you're verbalizing your burden to God and saying in a raw way, this is what's really going on. A father friend of mine said the most real his prayer life ever got was when he just was on a walk with God, just yelling, Yeah, my prodigal son. He's a first generation Christian. Both mm-hmm. of his boys weren't walking with Jesus and he had given his life to try to raise a Christian family. Mm-hmm. They both walked away and he was just in angst and anger as 
both of his sons were so broken and life had broken them. And he just, it's when his prayer life developed, when he just began to just, just go on a walk and just say, God, I did this. I believed and why not? And then he prayed a prayer where he said, if my boys never walk with you, I will still follow. Mm. It's beautiful. And it was the emergence of his mm. prayer life. It was the emergence of like, okay, I have decided. I am not in, God is not my means to my end that I want. God is not the means, the method for me to get what I want. God is the means and God is the end. He is the relationship and I want changed circumstance. I want healthy relationships. I want a healthy body. I want financial prosperity. I want people to come in. I, we want those things. But, but the, the end game is I am, I'm doing life with God, the with God life, right? I'm doing life with God. So I'm taking these burdens and I'm casting them on him and he cares. And it's in, even in that challenge, that dark night, that season, that difficulty that you'll see your prayer life really flourish. And, and even if you go through seasons where he doesn't seem close, even if it, you go through seasons where it seems like the circumstance doesn't come, but you are taking God at his word and you're functioning like that child that just hurls it on him. I found myself hmm. uh, enjoying prayer more um, in the car where I just, um, you know, in the 90s, I would listen to the radio <laughs> in the early 2000s, I would listen to t sermons. Then I started listening to podcasts. But when I just stopped and used car time to just cast the burdens mm -hmm. and just um, not let mentors and models that have tried other ways, but just what works for me? What's, what's a way in, in my context, my city, my job? And just, just be real and honest. So uh, I'm a verbal processor. Uh, my wife is left brain Enneagram one, you know, and I'm a <laughs> partier seven, right? So when I'm with somebody in the car, I'm, I talk, I'm the life of the party, right? Uh, I found when I do that with God, I just, I'm the life of the party. It's like, what's up? Like, I just start talking to God. You, why isn't this, for, I'm a pastor now. God, I need this. God, why, why aren't we seeing more people come to know you? God, I need this in our city. God, and just be who I am and talk to God mm -hmm. with, w without letting Methods, mentors, models, be a barrier. Hmm. Just raw, honest. Do you know what strikes me about what you're saying about the car? Yeah. Is you're taking time to be alone with God. And that I know that's like sounds like, yeah, no kidding. But I, I actually think that is a part of what our generation is experiencing. Yeah. I mean, they call, you know, they're calling now what we're living through the anxious generation. Yep. And I think, you know, there's a lot of different kind of assessments of why part of the assessment of that is that we're so connected. Yeah. You know, we have, you know, we have our phones, we have just kind of the, the stimuli that's everywhere. But when I think, I think for a lot of us, I kind of throw myself in that category, being alone with God can be quite scary Yep. because I'm putting my phone away, I'm disconnecting. I don't, you know, I don't have the news or ESPN or the podcast. When you shut all that off, yeah. what's left is just your heart standing before God. That's a little bit scary. Yeah. So actually, I'm, I'm listening to you talk about the car, you know, praying in the car. And I'm like, that's actually pretty brilliant. Just shut it off. You can't, I mean, if you're driving, you can't, you know, you can't, you can't be looking at your phone anyway. <laughs> and so it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant place to create time and space to be with God. Yeah. Have you found other ways of being alone with God? Well, I mean, I think that we're, basically we're talking about fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. And I do believe that we're a connected generation where it's actually difficult at any time. Yeah. Car, shooting baskets on, with a basketball hoop, always have, yeah. always streaming something in. And to just stop, be alone with God, have a space, a place mm -hmm. where every day you're just with him uh, will be life to your soul. It is kind of the, the streams of living water. It is fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. It is a dialogue with God that gives strength to everything else. So for me, when I was in college, I um, went to the University of Oklahoma, and I remember a moment where 
it was rush week and um, all my friends were at different parties and I was reading Ephesians 5 by myself and it said, do not get drunk on wine, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit, sing him spiritual songs. And I began to just sing by myself and mm. just pray, you just alone with God in Norman. Mm. And it was like a river. It was just like, I began to just, and and I think that that, that life is what we're made for. Um, when you look at the garden, the way that uh, Adam is cast out, you know, in the garden, he walked with God. And that's what we're made for. What, hmm. what, what we're made for is closeness. And so finding a place to where we choose to do that. And it does take, a, you don't want the crisis to be the only reason why yeah, you pray. Yeah, right. No, right. You, you want to pray in crisis, but you want the joy of your life to have that space. So for example, you know, I have a set aside time for a date night every week with Renata, I have a, I have a set aside time to where Renata and I make sure that we talk every day. Hmm. I have a set aside time that I call Tribal Bible with my family. Um, <laughs> and I, awesome. oh yeah, well there were three when you know Dawson <clears throat> was three when I named it. Now these nineteen <laughs> little dated name, but um, my point is that, or even friendships, those that you value most, you create that space. Time, yeah, yeah, and so creating that with God, um, and and not using the digital uh, space in the world not the crisis in the world, not the person that hurt you, not the preacher that let you down, all that. But just, you got one life. And so finding that space um, to fellowship with God, because then it's like that river inside where, I mean, we read about historically people that uh, have gone through crisis like we've never known. And they've, they've, they've walked with God unto being martyred, you know? Right. And so I think, I think that, we need a dose of that. Yeah. And I don't think it has to be um, grandiose and um, a model that somebody put in front of you. Sometimes that works, but you, I like to say you do you yeah. and let it be as individual as you are. Every marriage is different. Every family is different. Let every relationship with God look different yeah. and don't be bitter. That's my pain. My pain is like, and I know I don't mean to be bitter, but by talking about people that are bitter, I just feel like... <laughs> I just feel like it's, I sit at, you know, a coffee shop with so many people that give me a reason why mm. they've given up on being close to God or, mm. or, or gathering with intercessors to pray. And it's, it, it makes me sad because at the end of the day, that's what the enemy wants. Mm -hmm. And it's any lie, father of lies, any lie to try to get you to pull back from that. Because that's ultimately what we're made for is, is that relationship with God. Hey, you listen like somebody who dreams big. At Every Home, our dream is to see Christ carried to everyone, everywhere. And now you can sponsor specific gospel work in any of the 165 nations where Every Home has an active ministry. Provide motorcycles to help believers navigate the treacherous jungles of Nicaragua. Disciple new believers in Papua New Guinea. Or bring comfort and hope to those impacted by war in Europe. Where will your gift take you? Learn more at everyhome.org slash give. I think a couple of things, so many things actually just rushed through my mind as you were speaking. Yeah. I think one is just creating time and space. Yeah. I think the argument sometimes, I'm, think, I'm just thinking of younger people who have a lot going on. Maybe they have school, young children saying they don't have time. And I think... Even if it's five minutes, 10 minutes, yeah. 15 minutes, everybody has that time. Or like you're talking about being in the car. You dropped off your kids at school. On the way home, it's part of my prayer time. It's just me and God. Yeah. So that's one thing that came to my mind. It's just creating time is so important. I think also creating a, a time and a space where there's not distraction. Right now, you might think I'm nuts, but... I, I don't run, I jog. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I'm like, a, <laughs> I like roll. I don't, I'm like, my wife, I run with my wife. Sometimes she like prances like a gazelle <laughs> and I'm just like, Ugh. and uh, anyway, but I love that time to talk to God because I don't have my phone. Yes. I can't check it yep. because I'm panting like a dying animal. Yeah. Um, it's in my pocket or whatever. Or I've left it in my, my rig. I love it. I love talking to the Lord. I get, I get an hour 
I've just talking to the Lord. I'm in, I'm out in nature. I yep. love that. That's just part of the way that I meet with God. So when you say you do you, I think people need a little bit of creativity. Totally. To find what the, the way prayer is going to work for you and your rhythm, create the time, create the space, create the attention span. Um, I think everybody can do that. Yeah, I challenge men and fathers in our <clears throat> church to pray an hour a week as intercessors. Yeah. And so that's nine minutes a day. And so if nine you can minutes. pray, yeah, nine times seven, 63. If you, can, if you can pray nine minutes a day as an intercessor and believing God for <clears throat> their marriage, their children, you know, their business, their evangelistic, who God's called them to reach, et cetera, our church, our city. And so I know that we have some guys that swim some guys that ride bikes, some yeah. guys that pray as they run, some guys that sit at a coffee shop with a vanilla latte. Yeah, it's all over the map. Um, so whatever spiritual pathway, whatever way, but have a way. Yeah. Just have a way. Yeah, I just think it's... Yeah, so I mean, there is a culture of people that feel like so shamed into <clears throat> prayer that they feel like uh, pr kind of prayer only or no prayer. And I would just say pray first. <laughs> it doesn't have to be you know, like all you do is pray, but don't have an absence of prayer in your life either. Just make it a priority. And why? Not, 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 not to prove to God, but for your own sake, mm -hmm. you know, for your own, as the deer pants for the waters, my soul longs for you. Like you, you're, that's what we're made for. Yeah. So that would be just great habits, I think, for people to form. And yeah, I'm believing God that we'll see that in local churches. I'm believing that we'll see, um, you know, in the, in the next decade, uh, praying churches all across the world yeah. and uh, praying churches are led by praying pastors. Right. It's, it's just, it's just by people that are willing to pray. Hmm. And so um, I'm believing God for that. I'm believing for a resurgence of that. Ugh, I think that's just imagine how that would change oh, yeah. a community or a family. I mean, you're, you're making the bar so easy. It's nine, nine minutes a day. Yeah. Um, I think anybody could do that. I yeah. mean, a man could do that, a woman could do that, a kid could do that. Yeah. Um, nine minutes a day talking to God about the world. I mean, we, we talk about, one of the things we talk about at every home, we talk about see and tell. You know, like this is like a healthy, a healthy form of witness, which yeah. is like see God, see your neighbor, right? Tell Love Jesus it. about your neighbor Love it. and tell your neighbor about Jesus. So it's just see and tell. There's, it's pretty straightforward. I think one, one thing that I've found beautiful in prayer is just telling Jesus what I just saw. Mm -hmm. Like, Lord, I just was at the, I saw the gas station attendant today and I could see the look of desperation in her eyes. Lord, I, I, just, I just pray. I, I, I don't know what she needs. Lord, can you do something? I, I think we've, we've made prayer, uh, I wanna be careful how I say this, so mystical. I, I love mystical prayer, actually. So I'm, I'm being careful about saying that. But, I think sometimes we've made it so complex. Yeah. Just talk to God about what your day was. Yeah. Like, Lord, I had a weird meeting with a guy, you know, it yeah. didn't feel right. Can you, I mean, that's kind of the Ignatian way. Yeah. I mean, some of these old um, intercessors of the past had these, had these ways of reflecting on their day yeah. that were so beautiful. And I, I think that's another thing. I think sometimes people are like, I get alone with God. Here I am. I'm alone with God. I created the time. I created this space. Oh my Lord, what do I say? <laughs> what do I even talk about? And I think it could be pretty simple. It could be as simple as telling Jesus about your, your That's life. That's why I love the comparison to like a relationship that you do love in your life, right? right? Like uh, I do date night with Renata where we go on Sunday night because I've already preached that day. I'm, for me, I'm the most wired. My adrenaline's going. I'm like the farthest from preaching again. That is a great night for a date night. Yeah. And Renata loves Mexican food. Like that is the girl <laughs> that I married. She Praise loves God. Mexican food. So that's what a date night looks like for us is let's go out. Let's sit there a long time. Let's eat Mexican food. Let's laugh mm. on a Sunday night. Well, that fits us. Everybody would be able to talk about a spouse or a child or a friend in their lives that that relationship is significant to them. And it's different. So let your relationship with God do the thing where you connect with him, you know, yeah. uh, embrace that. And so that's, that's one of the things that I'm believing God for right now is that we would have a swelling of people that spend time with God uh, in prayer. And I'm coming back to it again, but in the local church across America, hmm. specifically where we, we literally do have people that weep and pray 
Like one of the things we do here at Ever for Christ is we challenge people to pray for the nations. Uh, Paul says in Philippians 1, I long for you with the affections of Christ, and this is my prayer. Hmm. The, the way that you gain a heart for the nations is to pray. So we see 10,000 streaming videos, right? We have information like crazy on our phones. We have people telling us stats and needs and the brokenness. In prayer, your heart will get connected That's right. to people, to yeah. what God wants to do. It's so true. And so you won't long for the people of Nepal if you haven't prayed for them. That's right. It will be a stat. It will yeah. be a picture. But if you have prayed for them and you've cried out to God for them in time, this is what I used to tell kids about their youth groups, right? Like, And so we'd, we'd get, I, when I was a youth pastor, I would, I would just get kids praying for their school every day and they would shift to where they wouldn't want to. They would value the prayer meeting more than the sports team. And that's counterculture. And often it was parents that were the most frustrated by that because the parents are so American culture more than kingdom culture. Yeah, right. Right? But if you will take, all right, that time with God and be that devotional mm -hmm. prayer and then add in starting to pray for others where you pray for your spouse, pray for your children, pray for your church and pray for your city, pray for the nations. Like yeah. just, the, I, like the benefits of intercession are amazing. You, you, you choose to pray because of the biblical conviction and then God on the other side of it shocks you because you're surprised. God, I wanna follow Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, so I'm going to pray, all right? And then boom, you find yourself, I'm close to God. Abraham, the intercessor, close to God. Moses, the intercessor, close to God, right? You find yourself just close. I mean, I, look, I think of Jesus, the intercessor in John 17, and he's just with his father as he's about to go to the cross, just... There's that closeness, which is what you're made for. So the brokenness of the world, the needs of the, the poor, the hurting, the unreached, the orphan, the broken city, the situations in the United States that are so challenging. But you start to pray uh, as a biblical command just because Jesus told us to do it in obedience as a disciple. And then you wind up going, ah, I feel close to God. You know, uh, for me, um, my dad uh, almost died in 2020. Hmm. And my family spent 26 nights while my dad uh, was in the hospital hmm. and he was close to death, believing, asking God for a miracle. And every night getting on Zoom, asking God. And I found that I, the reason why I was asking was I wanted my dad healed. I wanted I, I, God, I want my end. That was ultimately, that, I, that was just straight up. Oh, I need this, right? But the method of intercession created surprise benefits. I ended up after 26 nights of intercessory prayer, looking to the Lord in tears and saying, I trust you. Like I've never trusted God. Like I just, if, if my, the worst of it happens, you're still good and I'll follow you no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I trust you. And I found myself close to God, even in that pain and that crisis. I found myself closer to my family than I'd ever mm -hmm. been in my life because we're like going to war together, just believing. You know, like I think I have close friends that cheer for the college football with me or the, you know, football. The, the, those friendships that like to bike or run or lift weights or, or those are nothing compared to the relationships, believing God for a, a miracle. Mm -hmm. And then on the on the back end of it was God healed my dad. My dad lived. I saw the power of, of God. And you just go, why would I give myself to Netflix and Prime Video and perpetual Spotify if there's more? And I know that can sound pious. I don't mean to sound yeah. pious. Yeah, yeah. I just want to be like, a, just, just happy, just grateful, you know, that on the back end of that, you know, you see God move. So I'm, uh, I'm just, I, I feel like, you know, prayer became a thing for me uh, as a 14 year old. And, you know, now I'm, I'm getting, I'm older, but I, I would say, you know, 30 something years later, um, I just, I just believe in my bones that there's hidden gems in us giving mm -hmm. ourselves to it in a faithful, not perfect. We're all broken. Mm -hmm. We say broken things. We have we're not disciplined. My wife is more disciplined than I am. You know, <laughs> my sisters are more dis I'm, I, I'm not talking about perfect spiritual discipline, but I am talking about 
a, a resolution in my heart. You know, my 19 year old, he's just put the, he's put 70 resolutions, you know, on his wall where he's like, yes. yeah, resolved, you know, the <clears throat> Jonathan Edwards type stuff. Yeah. And, and there's this one side of that where you're like, oh, don't overdo it because, you know, you're probably going to fall short. But there's this other piece of it that's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just say, I just want to resolve to, I want to resolve to live this way. And I just think in our pastors, our marriages, our, our kids, our churches, we just need, let's just get that resolve to be a praying people, yeah. you know, and build it into our, to our lives. We live, you know. You lived here for years, but I, this is Colorado. We're sitting in Colorado, yeah, one of the most fit states, yeah, in America, yeah, and which is sometimes depressing, like when you're <laughs> when you're not like when you're just trying your best to jog, you know, and somebody's flying by you in like Olympic, oh, Olympic or you're going colors. up the incline yeah. and then somebody just flies by you, yeah, that's twenty five like, oh, years older than you, and you're like, oh, so, oh, this is oh. horrible. <laughs> but I just think of the conviction, yeah. that Colorado has. Yes, they have this deep conviction about working out and. When you start working out, yeah, it's not great. I mean, it feels like you're going to, for me at least, I mean, maybe there's somebody out there that's great. <laughs> for me, it starts out literally just as conviction. It, it's just, I know I need to work out. I know it's healthy for me. I know it's good. For those first, maybe for me, it was like months of like, I'm just doing this out of conviction that this is good for my health. And then at some point, though, you start to experience kind of the, you know, the endorphin hit where you're like, oh my goodness, I feel good. I feel good about myself. I feel good about life. This is changing my mindset. So I feel like if we can do that as something as simple as, you know, working out or a diet or something, how much more prayer? Think, I mean, just think about, I, I think that we need to get back to conviction when it comes to something like prayer. If we're going to just do things that feel we're just looking for quick gratification. Yeah. We're not going to pray. I mean, just that's, that's the truth. There's moments when you have quick gratification in prayer. There's so many moments, though, when you're just grinding it out. Like, Lord, I, I need you. Lord, I pray for my family. I pray for, you know, the five million people today that are displaced in Sudan. Or, I mean, you don't feel anything. Totally. Um, so <clears throat> I love the way that you framed intercession prayer on conviction. I think it's really important, especially for younger generations that maybe you have... We're just a little bit soft. I mean, I don't know how else to say. We're just a little bit uh, undisciplined in that kind of And stuff. some of the younger generation is more disciplined. Yeah, know? right, right, right. I'm That's speaking about amazing. millennials mostly. I'm speaking about myself, really. <laughs> um, so we do a youth conference with Gen Z, and I told stories about <clears throat> kids that um, had spent time with God in prayer every day. And... So I was encouraging kids, and I wasn't trying to give them, like, the everydayness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just trying to encourage them to be teenagers that pray. And... This teenage girl uh, came to me uh, years later and said, hey, I just want you to know that uh, when you encouraged us to spend time with God every day without missing a day, um, I started to uh, a prayer journal where I uh, awesome. kept track of never missing a day. And now mm. it's been over a thousand days without Whoa. missing a day. And I just mm. think like that's Gen Z. Like we're that's not, that's, that, that's young. That's yeah. someone who's in high school. Yeah, right? that's right. And I just think uh, that's beautiful. Not legalistic. It's just, it's just schedule first what matters most. Yeah. That's you know? Some, that's summary right there. <laughs> schedule first what matters most. Yeah. Make it a priority. Let me hit you with our last question. I ask this at the end of every podcast. Yeah. Um, I, I gave you like a whole like 25 seconds of preparation for this before we started the podcast. Tells you I'm going to ask this question. It's actually is some terminology that the terminology carry Christ. Yeah. Um, I gleaned actually could be controversial to some, I hope it's not, but from mother Teresa mm. and her, she started an order yeah. uh, there in Calcutta and they said that their, their mission was to carry Christ to the most marginalized and ostracized and the poor. And when I had read that, man, my heart just jumped. I love the, the ambiguity. Of, a, of something like carry Christ, how it can be. Um, your answer to what does it mean to carry Christ is gonna be different than mine. Yeah. Um, but it, it also feels very New Testament to me that we're the fragrance of Christ or we're ambassadors, God making his appeal through us. I, lo I just love this language. So I ask this question every podcast, I get yeah. to the end. What does carrying Christ mean to you today? 
The first thing that came to my mind when you said it is Acts 4, uh, when they saw the boldness or the courage of Peter and John, they took note that they had been with Jesus. Yeah, come on. And I think uh, we have many people that are not courageous and bold hmm. because they haven't been with Jesus. Yeah. And so they want to just be hurt, cynical, debate, uh, and frustrated at something instead of just being courageous and bold with mm. the gospel mm. and just want to share Christ in every nation and just want to go to the last home and just want to share Jesus in their city. There's not courage and there's not boldness because they have been with him. But the mark of the disciples who had been with him was courage. It's mm. boldness. And so, uh, okay, I'm going to, uh, this is crazy. Do All it. Right, this is crazy. But this may, I've never said this before. But so I was <laughs> on my, my family just got back from vacation. Yeah. And uh, I've never heard, I've never watched Duck Dynasty in my life. <laughs> I had never, I literally, I had heard people make jokes about it. But I started watching this show. Uh, and I saw at, towards the end, as the season went on, I saw the way that the family would pray. And here it is on A and E. Yeah. And then, I heard this guy, you know, praying in the name of Jesus mm -hmm. in prayer. And I just thought, I, I watched it thinking it was gonna be slapstick silly, something goofy to watch <laughs> with my family. And I found myself like, where's this courage, right? Mm -hmm. And I know this is a long time ago now and I'm late to the party, but, and then I did my research on this guy who long before he ever was praying with his family and, uh, having these opportunities to be bold and having people with a guy in the backwoods of Louisiana getting to share his faith. He was spending time in the word of God with yeah. God. And I just think it made, him, it made him courageous. It made him strong. And I think that whether you're talking about a teenager at our bold conference who says, I mean, comes to me and tells me that and kids that, I mean, there are kids in Gen Z right now. They are so bold on their faith. They're preaching on TikTok yeah. and they're strong Sweet. and they are courageous It's and bold. Or you're talking about older men in their last days, you know, in their That's last right. couple decades, I think that um, they're carrying Christ to their world um, because they've been with him. And so you tend to be like the people that you're with, Yeah. right? I won't let my kids watch too much Duck Dynasty because I don't want them to use that accent. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like you, you tend to become like those people, right? right. My kids, my, my, my kids, they act like me because they've been with me. Yeah. I act a lot like my dad because I've been with him. And so I just want to, I would say that. I would say carrying Christ is because you've been with him. So when you've been with him, then you know him. And when you've been knowing when you know him, then they can say, oh, I'm coming at you. And you'll say, Oh, count it a privilege to suffer for the name. That's awesome. We're gonna put in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, well, don't say Duck, Duck Dynasty. Dynasty. <laughs> no, we're gonna <laughs> I don't know. We might get in trouble for that. <laughs> Maybe I need to be bold. No. Uh, we'll put in the show notes, uh, bold, your bold conference. Oh, great. And then we'll put your radiant church as well. Just so awesome. if people want to go check it out. Yeah. I mean, you have a podcast as well with yep. your sermons every week. I yeah. was just checking it out this morning. Okay. I'm um, getting pumped about it myself. And so if people just want to just, I mean, they want to dive yeah. in more and pray. I think it's going to be great. It's awesome. But thank you for- it's an honor. Man, thank you for taking the time. It's an honor. David, I like, I love, I could just sit and talk to you forever. I love this conversation. I, I hope- for somebody who's yeah. listening to this, maybe who's discouraged and weary in prayer, mm. I hope that they feel encouraged. I hope they feel stirred again um, in a new way. That's that's the goal. I'm grateful for Gen Z, so I hope we get some Gen Zers just chirping in and excited about what we're talking about too. So thanks, David. It's an honor. Love Amen. you. Amen. Love you and love every home and just so grateful for the kingdom laborers that you guys are. It's beautiful. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on the Redeeming Missions podcast. If you like what you heard, we encourage you to visit everyhome.org slash redeeming missions to find all past episodes and learn more about every home and joining the efforts to carry Christ to everyone, everywhere, in every generation. Echoing Patrick, Christ with us, Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ in us. Let us carry Christ to our world. Until next time.